supporting the failing heart is an important part of intensive care practice. Intraaortic balloon pumps are an integral part of the treatment regime. Consider the following case example. A 55-year-old man presents with chest pain for six hours. On arrival, he is diagnosed with a non-ST elevation myocardial infarction with widespread ST depression. He is initially hemodynamically stable. Over the next four hours, his blood pressure worsens and his lactate rises. He is diagnosed with cardiogenic shock. In this patient, the cardiogenic shock is largely due to ongoing coronary ischemia. Treatment options such as inotropic support and afterload reduction will likely worsen the oxygen supply demand balance, the former by asking the heart to work harder and the latter by compromising coronary perfusion. Improving coronary perfusion can be achieved by increasing diastolic pressure However, this is complicated by increasing afterload, which increases myocardial workload and oxygen consumption. This case illustrates the classic catch-22 of cardiogenic shock. How do you reduce the afterload for the left ventricle without compromising coronary perfusion further? The answer to this conundrum is the intraaortic balloon pump. A balloon catheter is inserted into the femoral artery and is advanced until the tip is just distal to the aortic arch. The sausage shaped balloon is usually 22 to 26 centimetres in length and is filled by around 44 cc's of helium in the average adult. The balloon is inflated in diastole which displaces blood in both forward and backward directions. It does not completely occlude the aorta, rather it fills up to 80% of the cross-sectional area of the aorta, resulting in an increase in the aortic diastolic pressure, providing a driving pressure into the coronary arteries. This action dramatically improves coronary perfusion. The balloon is then deflated in systole. This action causes a marked reduction in aortic pressure allowing the heart to eject blood into the lower pressure chamber, reducing the work that the heart has to do. The result is a reduction in end diastolic volume and pressure, reduced left ventricular work, improved stroke volume, and better oxygen supply demand balance. This is nicely illustrated in these loops, which show that the effect can be seen within a matter of beats. Because the pumping action of the heart and that of the intraaortic balloon pump occur in different phases of the cardiac cycle, this technique is also referred to as balloon counterpulsation. The resistance of flow of a gas in a tube is related to the number of factors given by Pasquil's law. The narrow bore of the catheter, the length of the catheter, and the viscosity of air make it impossible to inflate and deflate the balloon at the rapid flows required. As a result, intraaortic balloon pump uses an alternative gas that is lower in density, thereby reducing its viscosity, helium. The catheter is then connected to the pump console containing the gas supply, the pump, the monitoring and the controller mechanisms. To effectively assist the circulation, the pump needs to know when to inflate and deflate, and to do so, a reliable physiological marker of the start and end of diastole is required. This is known as triggering. A number of triggers have been used. Traditionally, the surface ECG signals have been used. Inflation of the balloon is calculated from the R wave of the ECG and deflation is triggered after a defined period, if it's a regular rhythm, or by detection of a new QRS complex when the rhythm is irregular. 
Adjustment of the triggering is often possible when the balloon is found to be inflating or deflating at an incorrect time. This is usually detected by observation of the pressures in the aortic root taken from the end of the IABP catheter. These aspects, including intraaortic balloon pump timing, will be covered in more detail in a later vodcast. Triggering may also be based on aortic pressure wave. The balloon deflates at the point where the systolic upstroke is detected and inflates at the dichrotic notch. This process is enhanced by the use of fibre optic technologies now available in many commercial catheters. The primary use for intraaortic balloon pumping is to support the failing heart, particularly in conditions where there is impaired coronary blood flow, such as in atherosclerotic coronary artery disease. IABP can be used in cardiogenic shock, intractable angina, septic shock with poor cardiac performance, cardiac contusions, myocardial infarction complicated by mechanical defects such as ventricular septal defects and acute mitral regurgitation, prophylactically in high-risk patients and as a bridging device to transplantation and other mechanical supports. It has also been used in post-cardiac surgery to wean patients from bypass. As with any invasive device, a number of complications may arise. Bleeding, vascular damage, infection, embolism and thrombosis may all occur. The size of the catheter may obstruct flow to the distal limb, particularly in those patients at risk of vascular disease. Insertion of the balloon pump catheter may result in occlusion of the left subclavian if artery if placed too proximally, and care is taken to ensure that the tip is visible distal to this point on echocardiography. On chest x-ray, the tip is usually seen in the second intercostal space anteriorly. Inflation too early in the cardiac cycle, or deflation too late, may result in the already weakened left ventricle contracting against a partially obstructed aorta and may cause circulatory collapse. Inflation too late and deflation too early may render the therapy ineffective. Rarely, aortic injury and gas embolism may occur. This podcast was made possible with the generous support of Mayo Healthcare and Arrow International. We thank them for the use of the video and diagrams used in this podcast. If you enjoyed this presentation, why not visit our websites at www.crit-iq.com and www.crit-nurse.com. Critique is a leading provider of online educational resources for critical care clinicians. No matter what your level of experience or training, Critique has something for you. Our regularly updated journal club and podcast interviews will help to keep you up to date with the latest news, while our echo database and modules teach you new skills. We even have a series of new apps to help you on the go. You can even join our open access blog and have your say on current topics. Critique. Critical for life.